Uh, thanks very much, Toby. Thank you to Shep for sponsoring this session, and thanks to everybody for having me here at what I think is maybe my second or my third Hort Connections, Hort, uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. About 10 years ago, I started getting involved in farmer advocacy. So I'm a farmer myself from the Liverpool Plains up in northern New South Wales. Uh, up there, we grow some crops, we breed cattle, and we also have a little bit of a horticultural interest, uh, bigger than my uh, veggie garden in the back garden. But in the 80s, you might remember, there was quite a push into olives. And so we've got about 600 olive trees uh, on our farm uh, with mixed results. It certainly supplies us with some beautiful extra virgin olive oil that we get from time to time. Um, but I think uh, as I reflect on this morning and what an amazing morning we've had, uh, what excitement there is in our industry. Um, how lucky am I to be actually representing not just horticulture at the moment, but agriculture, Australia and globally, Australia-wide and globally. And um, how, you know, every day we wake up and think about the opportunities and the potential for Australian agriculture. At the moment, we are really in a sweet spot and it's really critical that we capture that sweet spot, that we actually capture those opportunities and try and make the most of a potential that really is ours for the taking right now. And some of the discussions and some of the things I want to share with you and talk about with you this morning is just the beginning of a conversation about how we're actually going to do that and how we must do that if we are actually going to keep growing uh, and, uh, and, and make the most of this amazing opportunity that we have right now in Australian agriculture because horticulture is very much a huge part of that. So today what I want to talk a little bit about who we are a little bit about what we do, uh, who is the NFF, what do we do. Um, you heard from James Whiteside this morning that uh, last year, at last year's conference, I think James talked about the fact that potentially that it might be a role for horticulture to get together and come into the national table at the NFF. I um, really, was really pleased during the year that we were able to deliver on that, and we now do have a council, so I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, and I'll talk to you a little bit about these exciting conversations that we've been having around Australia called Talking 2030, where we've been travelling around Australia, we've been talking to a number of people, we've been talking to producers, we've been talking to stakeholders, we've been talking about to people who are involved in the supply chain, and of course we've been talking to government about what's important in the national agenda and where we must go when we go towards 2030. So first of all, a little bit about the NFF. So founded in 1979, um, and really interesting in that back in 1979, we had some really strong advocacy bodies, farmer advocacy bodies, uh, but they decided there were some really big issues focused that they needed to focus on. And rather than just to focus on those individual issues individually, they'd be much stronger if they got together and spoke with one voice. So that was the vision that founded NFF, uh, I still firmly believe that uh, some of these big issues that we're dealing with now, some people call them wicked issues, uh, I like to look at them as opportunities and challenges that we can overcome. But uh, we do need a united voice. We will have more cut through, not just with the policy makers, but also with the community, if we talk to them in a way that they understand, in a talk to, in, if we talk to them in a way that they can relate, and also if we can talk to them in a way uh, where we are united and all asking for the same thing. So united vision, shared vision, uh, opportunity, it creates huge opportunities for us. And that is the, the mainstay uh, of, of NFF and, and why NFF was, sta was uh, started. Um, our external structure is that we have a board at the top that focuses on advocacy. And then we have uh, a number of members, about 35 members underneath, who are the organisations that represent the commodities and the farmers across Australia. So we have commodity groups like Cotton Australia, Grain Growers Limited, um, uh, sheep, wool, cattle, those sorts of things, as well as our farming organisations like New South Wales Farmers, Victorian Farmers Federation, uh, South, South Australia, all the states as a matter of fact, except sadly for the moment we're still to convince Tasmania to come back to the table. Uh, other than Tasmania, we have pretty much everybody at the table now and we are continually looking to expand our voice. So we represent the organisations, the organisations represent the grassroots farmers. That's how our advocacy model at the moment works. Uh, there's the board, as I said. We have the board, strategy board. We have members council, which is a little bit like the United Nations. 
uh, when the members come together and meet a couple of times, two or three times a year, uh, they all sit around this big round table like the United Nations, uh, and we talk about uh, policy issues that are affecting agriculture broadly uh, across Australia. And I'll talk a little bit about what they are at the moment. We also have a couple of task forces, energy and water, and, um, and we'll see where horticulture fits into that picture a little bit later on. We've heard a lot today about change. We've heard a lot today that we are in this process of change now, that we are in this process of innovation and exciting innovation. So, you know, I think too, as, as advocacy and Australian advocacy is also in that. Uh, first of all, you know, let's have a reflection on the past. And many of the farmers that, that I talk to reflect on this bygone era where we had 45,000 farmers rallying at Parliament House. Uh, 45,000 farmers rallying about changes to laws that they felt were unfair. Would we get farmers to do that now? Would it be as effective? And I guess there probably should be a question mark behind that bygone era thing because I think the, the, the question is, isn't there a better way to do it now? If we wait to organise rallies, if we wait to get people in buses coming to Canberra, if we wait to make all those organisations and things, policy may well have already moved on. Public sentiment may already have moved on. And in actual fact, we might have missed the boat. Advocacy, we think, is changing. And so do we. And we started out in a very small way, sticking our little toe in the, in the advocacy, online advocacy platforms with a, a platform called Australian Farmers. And it's had, some, it's had its, its ups and its downs, it's had its issues, but what we wanted to do was to enable a platform similar to GetUp, uh, and GetUp had to start somewhere or other, where we could talk to consumers with a united voice in a way that consumers would actually understand. So consumers, if they go to the horticulture Ausveg website, they're probably going to feel that, of course, they're going to, to read great stuff about veggies. Or if they go to cane, the cane sugar website, um, cane growers website, they're going to read some facts and, and figures about sugar that um, they may not necessarily be able to trust, uh, although they should. But in actual fact, if they read it on a consumer-facing website where we talk, we use language that they can understand, and we use words that they can understand. We heard Julian Cribb earlier talking about, you know, do we, is agriculture the right word to be talking about what we do anymore? Should we actually be talking about food, food and fibre? Food and fibre is much sexier. It's what consumers understand. It brings it right back to them, hard-hitting to them about what it's about. It's what they need. So shouldn't we be talking about that and those sorts of things? And that's why we started this platform, to see what we could do, to see whether it would work in the e-advocacy space for Australian farmers. And we've done it in a very small way. We've had uh, a few smaller campaigns that have been very successful. Uh, we've been able to put out their messaging to consumers uh, on a number of those campaigns in a way that has changed the focus of the old way of campaigning. Uh, people don't want to anymore, you know, necessarily wait for the process to go through. They don't want to have a motion go to a conference and then the conference decide on the motion and then the, the motion having to go through another whole series of a committee and something else and, you know, many, many processes in, the, in, in between before they can actually get action on a problem. What we now need is agility. We need to have processes in our advocacy bodies that are agile. We need to have processes in our advocacy bodies that can get outcomes for our industry, uh, utilising the latest tools and technology that we have available. And some of our organisations have quite a long way to go to get to that ag agility that we actually need. Our vision to make agriculture Australia's next $100 billion industry. Now, I could have had a punnet of blueberries there or strawberries or uh, an oranges or, or some nuts, but a lamb is much cuter. So, you know, on this case, we'll, we'll go with a little lamby. We have our immediate priorities um, that the committees, you, so we saw the, commi the committees that are working underneath the Members Council at, New, at NFF, and they are actually focused on a number of issues that are important for, for horticulture as well. So if we have a look, some of our committees, and these, these, these priorities are priorities that are at a national level. So we have things like, for example, global markets. Um, what about the ratification of the trade agreements? We've heard about TPP and other, and other, and other um, agreements like that. What do we 
what do we need to do if we are actually to, to actually ratify those agreements, if we're actually able to achieve some of the export gains that we can have. And I'm going to show you shortly a graph about horticulture and the growth that has uh, been exponential in terms of it, its export markets and where it is now reaching. Um, also, we need workforce. We know that workforce is a huge issue for, for horticulture, not just getting a permanent workforce, but also, of course, how we can actually maintain our workforce, how we can make sure that we have the people that we need to do the jobs that we have to do on farm. So currently, we're exploring with our members and with horticulture a, a dedicated agricultural visa. Now, that visa would allow us to bring workers in on permanent basis or temporary basis. We need to set the standards, and we think that most of the visas at the moment have been retrofitted for agriculture. So whether we're talking about 457s, whether we're talking about backpacker visas, any of these visas that so many people depend on so importantly, even though 457 was, was, was finished without consultation, uh, we need to actually be able to set up a visa that is set up for agriculture, uh, that, that will actually help our industry. Energy is obviously a huge issue for horticulture. That comes in under the Farm Business Committee. Environment, we've talked about um, sustainability already this morning. Uh, energy, uh, energy use, Murray-Darling Basin, water, all of those things critical for horticulture, as is infrastructure. Their, their priorities that we have right now in, in agriculture in Australia that we need to actually work on, and that's something that we are actually continually working on right now, but we actually also need to look further out and start moving the dial. We're in this huge wave of change. What are we going to look like into the future? How are we going to get there? And so because of that, we initiated our Talking 2030 project. Uh, which we were very pleased to have the Prime Minister launch uh, back in April. And it's then initiated a whole series of work that is going to look at where we actually go and, and how we actually get there. So the challenge we know is that at the moment, about $63 billion farm gate input for 2016-17. And that's a huge growth on where we've been previously. It's seen a growth of sort of 14, 15%. Um, and that's phenomenal. So we need to, over the last 12 months, and actually ABES just today has announced even more increases, uh, that it, we, we're actually still going up, even in the midst of some of the problems and challenges we have at the moment, like, like drought in Australia, we're still continuing to increase our, our output. So that's a very exciting story. So if we're looking at going from $63 billion to where we are now, to $100 billion in 2030, what are the sorts of things that we're going to need to get us there and how can we actually build those on? And we've already heard this morning, there's been talk about digital change, about technology, about reducing waste, I think James, James talked about, about increasing productivity. What are the sorts of things that we've wanted to explore and with the help of K KPMG, we've put out in a discussion paper um, to actually just explore about putting some meat around these policy ideas, putting some, some real um, details around these policies in a way that will actually get us to 2030. And we thought some of those things uh, revolved around digital agriculture for, my, for uh, digital agriculture, for example, whether we're talking about sensors, whether we're talking about real-time information, whether we're talking about capturing some of that blockchain technology uh, or, or IoT. All of those things are encompassed in the digital agriculture sphere. New markets. Uh, we've seen the enormous amount of new markets come on board. How can we keep delivering to those new markets? What about protocols? Uh, how can we get more horticultural produce overseas and other produce overseas? How can we keep focusing on that? Better branding. Uh, just in the last 24 hours, you may have read in the paper that the government has now started uh, a new committee, a task force that's focused on getting one national brand. Now, having been around this space for a while, um, we've, we've seen brands come and go, but clearly we've seen the success of New Zealand Pure. Uh, New Zealand Pure focuses on not just products, but also things like rugby teams. It's been a great seller for New Zealand. So what about if we had one idea, one thing that pulled all our Australian products together? Uh, let's not focus on a logo, let's focus on the brand. What does it mean to be Australian? What does it mean to be an Australian product of any sort? Uh, and can we actually work together on that, recognising the value that there will be to have that visibility in markets overseas where people are wanting to buy Australian. They're really wanting to buy Australian. Infrastructure. 
Uh, infrastructure for me is one of the most critical issues. So living where I live on the Liverpool Plains, you know, we grow crops twice a year, uh, summer and winter. Um, we've got lovely black soils that we really could grow anything. I mean, the thought of me growing broccoli, broccoli is fantastic. I'd love to grow broccoli, except that we are so far from market. What if we actually were to have some international freight, air freight terminals, you know, within a couple of hundred k's of me? Would that change what I do on my farm? What would happen to horticulture, some growth in horticulture? Potentially, um, particularly if we can couple that with easy access. Our DNA, it's critical that we uh, get the right R D N E. Our levies go to pay for some of these things, and it's critical that as growers, we're fully informed and fully involved in the process and are actually driving investment in the things that we need most, whether it's, whether it's increasing productivity or whatever it is. And lastly, again mentioned this morning, capital for growth. Where's that capital going to come from? Is there actually enough capital in Australia to actually provide us with the growth that would be possible? We would say probably not. So the challenge, the challenge ahead, and so Talking 2030 has been, uh, first of all, as I said, a discussion paper launched with the Prime Minister with the help of KPMG and Telstra. Secondly, the road shows, and we've been doing, I'll show you in a moment, a map where the road shows have been. We're right on the tail end of that now. But if you wanted to go online, if you haven't had a chance to participate in the Talking 2030 strategy yet, you can actually Google Talking 2030, you can go online, you can download this discussion paper, and you can actually input your comments or your emails online. So still really love to get some input into that Talking 2030 process because then we're going to prepare our strategy. Our 2030 strategy is going to actually outline some of the policies, some of the, it's going to drill down on some of the ideas that we've been raising over, this to, over the roadshows. And I guess for me, one of the best things about the roadshows too was actually the ability to tap people on the shoulder that we don't always talk to. So in agriculture, we're very good at talking to each other. Uh, we talk to each other at conferences like this, we talk to each other in the rural papers, we talk to each other on the rural media, we listen to Country Hour, we, all those sorts of things. But we probably don't enough look to talk to others in the community about what we do and how we do it. And so one of the great things about Talking 2030 was it really gave us the opportunity to get out there, to tap people on the shoulder, some of the best and brightest in our industry, some of the Nuffield scholars, some of the rural leadership people, as well as stakeholders and general community people who have all come along to these roadshows right around Australia. Last thing uh, 2030 is about um, is a leadership fund. And so uh, Telstra have generously donated some money that is going to be formed part of a leadership fund to actually follow through some of these initiatives, some of the most exciting initiatives um, that we can actually follow through with the help of this leadership fund. Roadshow locations, we stayed out of the cities, we went to the bush. Uh, we went, as I say, all over Australia. We've been pretty much everywhere now except for Wagga Wagga in New South Wales, and then we have a couple of professional ones as well where we're tapping into agribusiness. So it's been an exciting time as we've travelled around and talked to everybody about what they think is part of the future of Australia. Is it about being carbon neutral? Is it about having, uh, it, it, having regional uh, air freight terminals? Is it about education and talking to the consumer? Is it about talking as one voice? Uh, what is it? that is actually going to propel us towards the 100 billion in 2030 and how are we going to get there. So horticulture, as I said, in the last 12 months has become a part of the NFF family and that's been really, really exciting to see and with the great leadership and work shown by people such as Ausveg and APAL and others. So at the moment, because we're, we're doing one foot in the time and it's baby steps and we're all holding hands together and building trust, um, the Horticulture Council sits alongside the Members' Council strat structure rather than actually being in it. Now, we hope over time as people build trust and get used to working together, and we're talking about a group here where I think there's something like 83 organisations representing horticulture on its own, uh, as well as about another 83 that represent general agriculture. So hugely diverse voices, hugely disparate people, but, but all at the end when we sit around the table, there's so much that we can actually agree on. Uh, and so much that we have in common. And it's those things that we're actually focusing on at our Horticulture Council um, as we actually um, just have, we've, I think we're up to our third meeting now. So, you know, early days, but 
you know, very promising, and uh, we thank everybody for their, for their support and leadership, but it's fantastic as a national agriculture advocate to actually have horticulture at the table. It's so exciting when we go up to Parliament House, when I'm talking to the Prime Minister, when I'm talking to ministers, that we can actually say, the whole of agriculture supports this. The whole of agriculture supports this. Whereas in the past, I've had to say, the whole of agriculture supports this, but horticulture's not at the table. So, it's a very exciting, it's a very powerful thing. And, um, you know, I hope that it progresses from strength to strength. I hope we can continue to build on, on uh, working together and getting focusing on the outcomes that we seek by actually all joining together with the one voice. So we can see, for example, the, so we talked earlier on this morning about the growth in horticulture farm grape returns. So what we can see also though now, so $9 million industry in Australia horticulture, but look at the export growth. Now, even though, you know, I know people are very focused on continuing to get their products overseas and there's sometimes it's difficult when we're dealing with some of these protocols, particularly in some of the Asian markets. Look how much ex the, the horticulture has grown since 2013-14 from a, a lowly sort of 1.7 right up to now where we're um, th about a $3 million export industry. Amazing. Also, the, the horticulture exports, uh, also, that's a really fascinating chart as well. So we have a look at the fruit. What makes up horticultural exports? So we've got to look, look at fruit. Nuts is, of course, a huge one. Veggies, uh, nursery, and others make up the others. So I haven't got a more detailed chart than that, but I'm sure that if you wanted to, to look at that, there'd be those available through ABARES that would give you a better breakup of that. But clearly, at the moment, fruit, nuts, taking up a significant piece of the pie. The challenge for veggies, uh, things like broccoli, uh, bok choy, any of those sorts of vegetables is can we expand that and how can we actually make that bigger? I guess one of the opportunities for me too is when uh, I travel, so in, in January I led a, a trade delegation over to the Europe and the UK, particularly with the uh, talks at the moment about Brexit and the EU. And I was really delighted to have uh, horticultural representatives with us, so you might know, many of you might know Emma Germano, I'm not sure whether she's here with us today, but it was great to have that horticultural presence in, in, on our group talking trade over there. And I'm not sure whether you can all read that, but this is a, a photograph of some peaches um, and apricots in Harrods Food Hall, which would have to, I know, be one of the most expensive places to, um, to shop in the whole of the world. But there we have yellow peaches from Australia and apricots from Australia. And uh, I have to say the photo is pretty appealing. They're not the most wonderful peaches and apricots that I've ever seen in my whole life. 50 pounds per kilo. 50 pounds per kilo. So at the moment, the future certainly is bright if we can get more fruit and veggies overseas, if we can increase those export dollars, if we can actually increase our share of the export pie. Uh, and another great example from where I sit, last year I was in Japan and the Japanese absolutely love the table grapes that they eat. And again, table grapes has been a huge, huge increase uh, into Japan and, and feeding that market. The best thing for me about table grapes into Japan too is that the Japanese farmers were so nervous about them. They were nervous about whether, whether the, the consumers were still going to eat their own grapes when they got these wonderful Aussie table grapes in there which had such, such soft skins, such juicy fruit. Um, but what they found is, is that the, the Australian table grapes come in counter seasonally. So in actual fact, it keeps the consumers eating grapes the whole year round. Uh, and it's fantastic. So the Japanese farmers are on this huge uh, journey of learning about the benefits of trade to them and what trade can do for their consumers. And that's a really exciting opportunity, and I think, and something that we have to talk more about if we're actually going to, to keep debunking some of those protectionist myths that we see uh, right across the world uh, at the moment. Horticulture in the national agenda is one of the things that we're looking at 
is certainly not just about export markets. How can we grow those export markets for horticulture? How can we zone in and hone in on some of the protocols that are needed to actually drive the growth of particular commodities? But also, I think, around labour. And this is something that we talked about earlier. Um, we've been talking to, and, and Rachel McKenzie came and presented at our last Members' Council meeting about their Fair Farms initiative and some of the labour issues around that. But certainly, access to labour, the short-term seasonal labour and long-term permanent labour, we're getting some very good signals from government about an ag visa and what that might mean. So for us, that's an exciting opportunity. It's something that horticulture will be intensely interested in. And um, we look forward to working more with, with horticulture as we go towards, um, I think, hopefully getting that policy up. Lastly, um, thanks again very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I know that I'm standing between you and a broccoli latte. I'm not sure whether that's an exciting opportunity or not. But anyway, uh, uh, I'll look forward to tasting one myself. And, um, and of course, look forward to chatting to many of you over the next couple of days uh, here at this wonderful conference. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Fiona. <laughs> What's wrong with a, with a broccolato? Well, I'm not sure. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have that ring about I it. I don't know. Who's, um, who's also tried um, turmeric lattes? I'm just looking around. Uh, not a lot of takers. It's well, very good for the inflammation, though. Very well, good is, for the inflammation. It's, yes, it's meant to be there. Well, could you like not have a curry with turmeric in it, though, or a nice could. plate of broccoli? Yeah, they say you should have uh, black pepper at the same time yeah, as well. Um, yeah. Look, you spoke about a lot of things, and, and I'm just going to be... A little rude for a second, right? If I may, we talked about digital agriculture, talked about new markets, branding, infrastructure, R&D, all that stuff, which is absolutely fantastic. There's a bit that's missing because we talk about technology and processes. What about the people? Yeah, absolutely. Right, the, the people who are involved. And if we're thinking about the propensity to change of the average person who's a member, average farmer who's a member of your federation as such, if you think about visionaries and early adopters, maybe uh, next level down might be pragmatic people, then you've got conservative people, and then those you drag kicking and screaming into the new age, the, the laggards. What would you say the spread's like at the moment? I think actually at the moment, so the demographic, the technical specs are that the, dem and you're right, people is in there, and as we're going around, people, education, communication, are things that I didn't highlight in those six priorities, but are certainly coming through the 2030 discussion. So in terms of people, we want to keep the best and brightest in our industry. We don't want to see this flow of, of good, bright people out of our farms, out of our regions, and not just into the cities, but overseas. We want to keep them, but more importantly, we want converts. We want people who are passionately um, uh, excited about agriculture and about a future in agriculture and want to have a career in agriculture. And there's a multitude of careers in our new world with agriculture, whether they're financial, research, um, you know, farmers, uh, any of those sorts of things. There's a huge amount of careers. So the technical demographics for farmers, I think, have pretty much stabilised at yep. this sort of scary 56, 57 sure. age group. Yep. But what I am seeing when I go out into the regions is plenty of young people, plenty of young people who are excited, who want the opportunity, and who are in some ways providing leadership themselves, as we also talk about leadership and provide leadership about the need to change, the need to go forward in, in, to the new world in an excited way, not kick and screaming. No. We want to see the opportunities and take people along for the ride. So, if I was to go to one of the universities... Uh, That's not very rude, by the way. No, I thought you were going to be you know really what I'd say, rude. No, no, I was not. <laughs> but, look, if we, I went to one of the universities, especially the regional universities, would I find the ag courses, the ag degrees, full? Uh, I think you would, but I don't think you're going to find many ag degrees. I think that's part of the problem. So at the moment, we have a demand for jobs. We have uh, more jobs than we can possibly supply. Um, but one of the interesting stats, uh, last week I was at the University of New England at their smart farm, which is a really you know, exciting thing, sure. uh, full of you know, engaged young people and engaged professors. But one of the stats that I found was that it costs $23,000 because of the immersive experience that agriculture requires, $23,000 for each student that does ag at UNE uh, compared to, I think it's oh, less than a thousand for a law student. So, you oh, know. That's about right, really, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Any lawyers in the room? <laughs> well, well, I suppose there's not a lot of costs involved other than the lecture and the imparting, um, you know. 
decades or hundreds of years worth of legal knowledge. That's right. And I think, you know, that's one of the things. So I think the courses, yes, are full at the moment, but there's not enough opportunities and there's not enough courses uh, and there's certainly not enough graduates. And we've got a long way to go yet to keep talking the talk and walking the walk about increasing young people uh, and including young people in our industry and making sure that they can come through and contribute to to whether it's policy setting, whether it's um, you know advocacy ideals, whatever it is. I mean, I got involved because I realised that no matter how good I was at doing things on my farm, um, if the policies let me down, then we were you know swimming without a paddle. And if we didn't work together as agriculture, we were swimming without a paddle. And I've now got a, a son at who's at home and driving us in all sorts of exciting ways. So you know, I think that's the conversation we have to have. It's a great industry to be in. Let's bring young people in there. Let's be open. Let's look with open eyes at the future and see how we go there. And we've certainly heard this morning, Australia's good at it. Australia's yeah. great at it. We were the fastest growing. So who here knows? that we were the fastest growing industry in 2017. For the most part of 2017, Australia, agriculture was the fastest growing industry in Australia. I, Anybody I'm know? actually looking to see if there's any hands going up. Well, that's something you can take so away. So why don't we talk about that? Yeah, why absolutely. do we talk about all these challenges all the time and how, you know, how terrible everything is and how we're all too old and how we do all these horrible things? Let's change the conversation. Let's talk about how great we are. And um, you know, that's a, a massive stat last year. And you know, we kept saying it every now and again, but perhaps it was the way we were saying it, perhaps it was who we were saying it to. Um, we, need to we, we need to increase that conversation. Well, maybe that's a very good way of attracting and retaining the talent that we need to be able to manage this. Um, thank you so much for that insight. Um, uh, this morning, and it did round off this morning's session really well. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me again in thanking Fiona Simpson? Thank you.